All right. Uh, thank you for joining the, sorry, the Illinois Soybean Growers 2024 webinar series featuring Andrew Marganaw speaking about overlooked non-point source non-point sources of nutrient losses and their importance for achieving nutrient loss reduction targets. With that, Andrew, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Corey. So I'm grateful for the invitation to ISA to be here and to share with the group some of our lab's research on nutrient loss reductions and the science that is evolving on what we think of as source apportionment. Source apportionment just means well, the portions of the sources of these nutrient losses. So where is the nitrate, where is the phosphate coming from when we think about the state's budget of losses? And what I want to focus on, as Corey has mentioned, is on the non-point source sector, which we typically think of as being the same as agriculture. That's not quite correct. It is, uh, ag is in general the, the, the a dominant driver of non-point source but ag is not the same as non-point source, meaning there are other and non-agricultural non-point sources of nutrient losses. And today we'll talk about uh, what this looks like. The focus is on phosphorus because more so than for nitrogen, this the data suggests there's a lot of overlooked non-ag non-point sources. And then we'll talk about what this means for policy and then for achieving in the case of Illinois, the nutrient loss reduction strategy goals on reductions. So we live in the MRB uh, and specifically in Illinois, we're largely in the upper MRB. Uh, this is the most productive swath of land in the US. The Corn Belt is largely nested in the Eastern part of the MRB. And we know also that in the MRB, we're losing nutrients from a combination of point sources and non-point sources, which are sometimes oversimplified as cities for point sources and for farms for non-point sources. And in both cases, that's not quite exact. There are approximations. And the maps on the right just show you estimates of the relative loading for nitrate on top, darker green, more nitrate, and on the bottom for phosphorus, which is darker brown is more phosphorus loading. And these are both for point and non-point sources. So you can kind of make out how the map on the left matches with the map on the right. I want to begin this presentation by providing a larger reason why we're doing research on this topic. Um, our job as biogeochemists is to understand where things are coming from. And that includes source apportionment of nutrients in watersheds like our state. So this piece came out about, now it's over a month ago in the Chicago uh, Tribune. I think many of you have, have seen this. And it's a good example of, I think, the need for communicating to the public and to, and to policymakers, because we are in a policy webinar here, on the complexity of, of our nutrient losses. So this piece, I think, did an overall okay job. Um, I think it simplifies in a few cases where the sources of nutrients are coming from, especially for phosphorus. And I want to point out here that they make this statement that we see continued increases in the losses of nitrogen and phosphorus. This is in large part due to the more recent biannual report for the Illinois NLRS that came out this past fall, where we saw a 35% increase in phosphorus losses. But we know, and I'll show you shortly, that farmers have been applying less phosphorus in the last 30 years in our state than what they are removing with crop harvest. So they're under applying phosphorus, not over applying. And so this is a good example of how the complexity of phosphorus losses and some gaps in the science are missed in these kinds of public facing pieces. And I think that's a concern because we might have unrealistic expectations in our policies on nutrient loss reductions. So this is the big picture of why we care on getting the science right. I'm gonna walk through three challenges because you may have seen the abstract for this session talked about examples of non-fertilizer and non-point source losses of nitrogen and of phosphorus. I'll focus today's talk mostly on phosphorus, but I wanna give a flavor for three challenges that cut across nitrate loss reduction as well as phosphate loss reduction goals. 
So the first of three challenges that we face, and I mean we as the communities that live in the MRB, is detecting the signal. And what this boils down to is what we often hear, that interannual variability in weather, which largely means how much it rains from year to year, uh, is a big driver of the variation in our total loads, especially for nitrates. Nitrate, you can simplify how much we lose as a function of precipitation. The more water that pushes through the system, meaning soils, the soil profile to the watershed, then the more nitrate that's pushed through the system. This is a simplification, but at high level, it tends to predict nitrate losses pretty well. And so what we find in this example from a recent publication from Iowa State is that if you plot the nitrate load from year to year, it varies quite a bit. And that's what you're seeing in the blue dots. And what these authors did is that they tried to understand, do we have enough um, statistical precision? Do we have enough sensitivity in annual observations at the state scale of Iowa to be able to detect with confidence whether nitrate loads went up or went down or didn't change from year to year because of BMPs or was it just obfuscated by the rainfall? And what they found was that at the Huck 8 scale um, on the state of Iowa, across 29 of, of, of the Huck 8s, excuse me, they found that only in 3%, sorry, in only three cases, so in only 10% of cases for Iowa's Huck 8s, could you have enough statistical sensitivity to detect that there was a change in nitrate, either going up or decreasing or not even changing? but you don't have the confidence statistically to say, was there a five-year change? And this again is because the interannual uh, variation driven by precipitation tends to confound this effect. This is a challenge then, because it means that scientifically, we're just having a hard time being able to uh, know for sure, are we seeing changes? So detecting the signal is difficult. This is a reality of state scale assessment or even going down to the Huggate scale. Second challenge is source attribution or source apportionment, which is simply, as I've mentioned, where is the nitrogen and phosphorus coming from when it's being loaded to surface waters like creeks and rivers? So three snapshots to settle out or to lay out some, some key points. First is that we know that the amount of nitrate that we're leaching and exporting through tile drains is not simply a function of nitrogen fertilizer being put on. It's not as simple as more N being put on the field means more nitrate leaching. There's ample examples of this. In some cases, absolutely increasing N rate, especially over the agronomic optimum, does entail more nitrate losses. But in some cases, it doesn't. And here's an example that uh, we that we published recently in um, based on a study from near Blue Mound and just south of Decatur in Illinois. And basically across an N rate of uh, roughly 180 pounds to 225 pounds of N, shown here in kilo per hectare. Across this reasonable N rate gradient, we found that the highest amount of nitrate unleached occurred at the second lowest rate. So increasing N rates, and the yields were the same across these rates, by the way, we found that there was no difference or there was no decrease or increase in nitrate N loads, meaning we can't simply say more N losses uh, are going to result from more N being put on. We then, in a separate study, looked at leaching of nitrate, specifically the identity, using two isotopic signatures. Basically, isotopes are different flavors of the same element. And so there's what's, what is called 15N and 14N. And for oxygen, there's 18O and 16O. And because these ratios are a signature, they're a characteristic of different sources, like Haber-Bosch N, so a synthetic N, as in anhydrous ammonia, or UAN-28, or SOM, nitrogen, we can use these ratios shown here in 2D space to try to parse or tease out the sources. There's uncertainty and there's overlap, but you get a sense of where the nitrate is coming from. And what we found is that in this monitoring of nitrate leaching at a central Illinois site, only two of over a dozen samples of nitrate leached actually came or were directly in origin from Haber-Bosch N, meaning fertilizer N. So the majority of the samples at this one site that were leaching through the profile were coming from organic matter nitrogen that had mineralized, formed ammonium, and that rapidly nitrified into nitrate. So the point to make here is that 
a lot of our nitrate and losses are coming from soil organic nitrogen mineralizing. That's important to manage because that's a loss of native fertility, but it's an important distinction of it's not fertilizer origin, at least not from that season. And the third example here, uh, this is data by Lowell uh, Gentry is uh, showing how in some cases we can lose more nitrogen leaching through tiles under soybean, which does not receive N fertilizer than from corn. This is an extreme example, but I think it's important to note that there are cases where things conspire because of weather, et cetera, where in this one site in central state, we saw 4X more nitrate leaching under soybean than under corn. Now, in many cases, it's more like it's equivalent, which points to the role of SOM mineralizing, as we saw in a second example. And that same process might explain why we see non-linear relationships between N being put on and N being leached. There's another thing contributing, and that would be organic matter. The importance here then is that magnitudes are not source attribution. What do I mean? Just because you estimate, say, uh, 18 pounds of nitrate and leached, like in this figure on the very left, doesn't mean that it came from fertilizer. It could have come from fertilizer, but also from SOM in the case of nitrogen. The third challenge, broadly speaking, is lag times, meaning that when we lose the nutrient or when the nutrient, be it nitrate or phosphorus, hits the water, be it the stream or the lake, for it to actually be exported, be it the USGS super gauge that empties the Illinois into the Mississippi or the Gulf of Mexico, pick where you want to uh, gauge it. But from when it's lost to, to when it is picked up on or detected in the gauge, that time might be substantial. These are called lag times or legacy times. And this further complicates our understanding and our ability to budget, where do things come from? So again, source apportionment is challenged by these lag times. And what I wanna focus on for the, for the rest of today is that in the case of phosphorus, this is especially the case. So let's talk a bit more about phosphorus. And I wanna lay out two definitions when it comes to nutrient losses that are good to keep in mind. One is called legacy phosphorus. The other is residual phosphorus. And sometimes you hear the latter called the former, but we should keep these terms distinct. So as we argue in this recent publication, legacy phosphorus is a relatively new term. It began in Florida in the 2000s, thinking about um, past disturbances or entry of phosphorus into the watershed system. And the idea is that there's lag time. So the legacy of phosphorus, be it from fertilizer or even be it from erosion of sediments, having nothing to do with ag, in any case, it's something from the past that is still in transit in the water system. In contrast, residual P is more of an agronomic term. It's been around since the 1930s from studies first with uh, corn in Iowa on the residuality of a P application. So residual phosphorus is sometimes called legacy soil phosphorus. And the idea is similar, but distinct. Distinct because it refers to specifically an accumulation of past phosphorus addition. So you put on manure or DAP or uh, TSP from three years ago to 30 years ago, and it's still there because it wasn't all exported with crop harvest. And in some cases, residual P can contribute to legacy P, but not always. So that's why it's good to keep these separate. The scales are important. One is a agronomic soil scale, residual P. The other is the watershed scale, legacy P. So let's now talk about the MRB with respect to phosphorus. So across the MRB, we're losing, on average, 0.7 pounds of P per acre. That's across all the acres of the 31 states that drain the continent's biggest uh, river, or rather the biggest basin. And if we look at different MRBs like the Ohio, we're losing a little bit more, 1.1. If we think about the upper MRB, which would be where Illinois is largely situated, that would be 1.4, 1.2, depending on the estimates, pound per acre. At the same time, we know that these regions are the most productive. So if we think about Illinois, our agronomic PU sufficiency or PUE, meaning the percent of P fertilizer applied that is used by the crop is quite high. We're upwards of 60 to 80%. That's pretty good because globally speaking, PUE is 16%, one six. We are four to five X that in much of the upper MRB. So this might seem like a paradox. 
right? An apparent par uh, a apparent paradox, excuse me, because it seems that we're one of the most efficient users of phosphorus fertilizer in the union and in the world for sure. And yet we are also in the upper MRB, the largest contributors of phosphate losses till the Gulf of Mexico. And our state is number one in phosphate loads. How could this be? What's going on? Well, the problem is that being very efficient with their applications still leaves room for considerable impacts on water quality. And also, it might be that a lot of our pee isn't actually from fertilizer. So these two things together might explain this apparent paradox. It's not really apparent. Let's look at the issues of disparate magnitudes. Just what matters agronomically doesn't matter for, or sorry, what matters for water quality does not matter agronomically. So if you're a Huck 8 watershed, that's a hotspot of P loss. So you're a priority P watershed in the Illinois NLRS, like the upper Embora shown here with the, with the um, arrow, you're roughly 1.8 to maybe 2.2 pounds of P per acre. And this is a not P205, this is elemental. So that would be something like four to five pounds of P205, okay? Assume a typical quote unquote application of DAP of 200 pounds of DAP per acre, that will be applying 40.5 pounds of P, not P205 per acre. So what this means is that um, if we are losing 1.8 pounds of P per acre in a hot spot watershed of loss, that is less than 5% equivalency in magnitude. Not that we're losing the P, but just the equivalency. So to sort of flip that, it means that we could be 95% efficient with our P applications. Globally, again, it's 16%. We're already at 60 to 80%. Let's assume that we get to 95%, and that's still leaving room for P losses. Now, the key here is that we're not necessarily losing our P from the unused phosphorus. And this is where the calculation of non-point sources is really important. So let's talk about how we calculate or how we derive non-point sources. This is part of apportionment. So non-point sources, by definition, are hard to measure. They're diffuse. This came out of contaminants like lead in the 1980s, and it's being used for nutrient losses today, this concept. So the idea is that we can measure the total loss, so the total export of phosphorus from the state with these super gauges by USGS. And we also know the point source contributions because, by definition, a point source has to report in our state monthly discharge loads of phosphorus. So think of wastewater treatment plants, uh, ethanol plants. There's 210 of these across the state. So we then derive non-point sources by difference. We mathematically are going to subtract the point source from the total. And then the leftover is the non-point source. So the problem is when we begin to equate non-point source with agricultural losses. And we don't know that because non-point source includes, but is not limited to, to agriculture. So here's an example from the Illinois NLRS. Um, and what we can see is that we've got point sources in red, for sure, we know that. The total size of the circle is the total export, we know that. Urban is 4%. Note the green part of the pie. It says agricultural. That is incorrect because technically we didn't measure agricultural P losses. We measured non-point source losses. So by equating ag with non-point source, we are over apportioning to agriculture, meaning we are overestimating agricultural's actual contribution to P loads in the state. So this is incorrect and it needs to be updated in the state NLRS. This right here, is a prime example of why we're losing phosphorus from non-agricultural sources in the non-point source sector. And this is a stream bank eroding. This is a um, this is on, on Polcat Creek, which feeds into the upper Ember. So this is just an hour south of campus. Stream bank erosion is a natural process, and it is, I think, the quintessential example of a blind spot that we've missed in source apportionment with severe consequences, or let's say important consequences for policy. So stream banks, they meander. And meandering just means that they snake, they change their course across the landscape as shown here for the Mackinac in central Illinois. <clears throat> Over decades from 1939 to present day, it's changed its course as you can see. This is a perfectly natural process. Streams will meander. They meander more 
in a flatter landscape because they seek to find the lowest position in the landscape. And when things are very flat, there's no clear winner of where's the low spot. So these streams meander more and more trying to find in vain the low spot. So because this process involves the sloughing up of stream banks through undercutting as the stream migrates, we get a transfer of phosphorus into the water. And this means then that we're going to have an undercut that eats away. And after many years, all of a sudden, there's a hot moment, a flashpoint, where the entire bank collapses from the undercut. It's called mass failure, meaning a lot happens all of a sudden, and we need decadal time scales to capture that. Now, once the sediment is in the system, that sediment contains phosphorus naturally. So with no fertilizer being added, there's still tremendous amounts of phosphate, phosphate loading into these streams. Now, the sediment may re uh, may be redeposited on a bank, like in a point bar downstream. So there's a kind of a, a hopscotch or leapfrogging where the sediments might be uh, deposited, then they'll re-erode or re-mobilize like in a floodplain. And it takes a while for the sediment to work its way down the stream. This is part of the legacy uh, lag time challenge that we discussed as a third challenge. Now, in addition to the very stop and go leapfrogging of sediments down the stream channel, which might take 100 years for it to exit the state. We also have varying release rates of dissolved phosphate from the sediment phosphorus. <laughs> Excuse me. So as we know, total phosphorus in soils, including stream bank soils, um, includes a very small fraction that is immediately soluble. It's what crops use, it's what organisms like algae use. That's what's shown here as the red. So when these so when these uh, soils erode from the banks, there's an immediate pulse of dissolved phosphate. But then there's other forms, four other forms shown here by color, that will release at varying rates depending on the chemical form of the phosphorus. And some of these forms like apatite, calcium phosphate, are very insoluble in water. They might take a very long time, decades or many, many decades to dissolve into DRP. So there's varying release rates as well as the tumbling of sediments that can lead to lag times. Why does this matter? Well, these lag times might explain why we see unexplainable increases that are also, in spite of BMPs on the landscape of ag, to decrease P losses. So for example, we just saw a nearly one third increase in P loads across the state, but we know that we've been under applying phosphorus relative to crop removal rates for the past 30 years across the state. So this is an apparent paradox again, how can we be having a 35% increase in P losses driven by the non-point source, by the way, when we have farmers that are not over applying P, they're actually under applying agronomically speaking. Well, this is exactly one potential reason, or let's say explanation, that there could be transient re-release of these legacy sediments already in the channels of streams. Now, if we think about contributions of stream banks to P loads, we've done a few meta analyses here as well as looked at some recent state, neighboring states results. So the graphs on the, on the left show you, globally speaking, a product that we have currently with USB support, showing that on average, uh, stream bank erosion is 33% as the uh, geometric average, so the median. Roughly just under a third of the sediments in streams and in watershed export globally are from bank erosion. And that's about the same 31%, 30% as the phosphorus. So globally speaking, this process of stream banks eroding is just under a third of our P loading. And that 31% matches very well. In fact, it's the same number that Iowa State recently estimated for, well, our neighboring state, where their 31% means over 18 years, the last 18 years, stream bank erosion is loading a magnitude of phosphorus to Iowa streams that matches the total P export of that state. So stream bank erosion is not trivial in magnitude, it's actually quite appreciable. A study that just came out, I just saw this yesterday morning, so it's hot off the press or fresh off the press, from Northwest Ohio. So we've got the corner of Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana here. And this is the heavily uh, tiled, very high clay region that we often think about as the northwest corner of Ohio. And they did a very nice study using isotopes, radionuclides, specifically to look at source, uh, source apportionment under different kinds of land uses. 
and they baked the land use into the sources. So the legend right here shows you that we've got cropland, forests, stream banks, roads. And what I want to point out is that the blue is stream banks. So a few things to note from this figure across this region, we see a lot of blue. So the percent of phosphorus, or let's say, excuse me, sediment loads, which contain phosphorus across this region, especially the south part of this region on the Ohio end around here, it's largely coming from stream bank erosion. So in some cases, it's largely from ag uses, in this case, pasture. So this also points out that the sources will vary tremendously. So an average might hide more local contributions. Now, overall in the study, they found that stream bank erosion was up to 40 times higher under forest than under pasture or cropland. So one thing is, what source is responsible? Is it cropland, pasture, forest? The other is, or excuse me, these stream banks. The other is the erosional rates. So a key finding of this recently published paper from Ohio is that stream banks erode more in this part of the world under forest. Second, if we think about the sediments already in the streams, where did they come from? Well, they found that there was no difference in the amount of sediment P already in the stream channels across land uses. So whether you had pasture, cropland, forest, didn't matter. And what they found was that the majority of the sediments in the streams were from stream banks, from half to 96%, again, in this region. Now, in the upland regions, so especially up to the north of this, uh, we had less contributions from stream banks and more from upland, meaning pastures or croplands. So this makes sense. When we have flatter landscapes or lower down in the watershed, we have an increasing contribution of these legacy sediments from stream banks. The authors also found that roughly from one fifth to half of the sediments already in the stream channels were recently contacted by rainfall. And this is what you can do with these isotopic methods. Long story short, within less than five months, they had been remobilized. What this means is that we've got redeposition and re-erosion of sediments. There's that hopscotching or leapfrogging down the stream channel, and we've got stream bank erosion. So Roughly half of, or up to half of these sediments that are tumbling down the streams and chronically releasing phosphorus are relatively new, less than five months. And I think to me, what stood out from this study that really impressed me was when they looked at the amount of phosphorus, the P concentration in the sediments already in the river channels, what they found was that there was more P content in these sediments in the stream beds than in the stream bank soils that weren't yet eroded or from the fields or the forest soils, meaning that these stream beds sediments are acting as a magnet. They're sucking up dissolved phosphorus that enters into the stream. In other words, what we have already in our streams are acting as a buffer to help retain phosphorus and then re-release it. So this gives you a sense of the importance of the sediment aspect of our watersheds. All right, well, these are two studies that are ongoing or that have been published. What about in the MRB specifically? Not global, not Ohio. What about MRB at the state scale? We are about to publish a meta-analysis that was done with U.S. Soybean Board on this. Only 51 studies have reports of studies. Sorry, only 51 studies that, that have done something measuring of bank erosion in the basin. And uh, of these studies, we find that there's none in our home state. Most of these studies are being done either with erosion pins at small scale or remote sensing at large scale. But note that they're relatively young. They're less than 15 years and most are less than five years. Really, four years is the maximum, which is how long grants go for. So that's why it's probably four years. As I said, we need to have long time scales because of the decadal shifts and bank meandering. Now, what we found was that the range of stream bank phosphorus erosion contributions was roughly two to 44%. That's quite a wide range. So the relative contributions are significant in some cases. And the value was 0.7 pounds of P per acre on average from these studies. And that matches exactly with what we were saying at the beginning, that on average across the MRB, we're losing 0.7 pounds of P per acre across all the sources. So this is a this is a, this might sound like a different uh, paradox, but it's just simply pointing out that the magnitude is significant of stream bank loading of phosphorus. And second, we have gaps. So of the more Western Corn Belt states that have published studies on bank erosion loads of phosphorus, 
they're finding a magnitude that is equivalent to the MRB average. But again, in this part of the Corn Belt, we have higher, about 1.2 pounds of peat per acre. That still is roughly half of our total peat loads. Two takeaways, we have data gaps, so we can't use a meta-analysis by itself. We need better field data. And second, the magnitude of peat loading by bank erosion is appreciable. If we think about at the policy uh, level, what is known at the state scale of stream bank erosion contributions to pea export? And we saw that there's one estimate for Iowa. It's not yet in their state NLRS, but at least they have a statewide estimate with good data from Dr. Schilling. But that's the only state. All of their states have no estimates state scale. They may have a watershed or a catchment studied in a few states that were published, but that's not a state estimate. So we went through all of the state strategies uh, from our states, uh, all the other states, 12 of them that have an official plan. So roughly 12 of the 31 basin states have a NLRS. And we also looked at the updates because some states update this every two years, like our state does. Some states do it once every four to five years. And what we find is that neither in the original plan nor in the updates, are, is there any explicit quantification of bank erosion, let alone any addressing of how that is important for source apportionment. So can we subtract stream bank erosion from ag contributions? So our state does a good job of at least acknowledging it. We say the word bank erosion. Some states don't even say stream bank erosion or bank erosion. So again, no states account for bank erosion in their non-point source apportionment. This has four consequences, as we describe in this uh, policy paper that was published about a year ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. First is that we are definitely overestimating ag contributions to the extent that stream bank erosion is happening. So in, in, in the case of Iowa, that would be roughly 31% of their P export that would otherwise be counted as ag is not actually from ag. Second is that we're losing or we're missing out on a chance to potentially manage a source of non-point for of non-point source phosphorus. There could be things like uh, wetlands or buffer systems that can be built in certain watersheds at choke points to try to uh, decrease bank erosion potentially. Third, as a consequence of number two, is that we might be misdirecting resources. BMPs on crop acres won't help us stop stream bank erosion if we can even stop stream bank erosion. And I think fourth is really important, going back to, to the Chicago Tribune article, we may not have good expectations especially from the public and policymakers, as well as researchers and farmers, on how long would it take and how much effort is it going to take to decrease phosphorus loads from Illinois and from other states. So two questions might arise. First is, hold on, why don't we have any good data or any data on stream bank erosion contributions to payloads? And I think the reason for this, we don't have to really ask, we can find the answer specifically in the 2015 Illinois NLRS biannual report, which says we don't include these estimates because we don't have data. And that's fair enough. It's a very challenging thing to do. We are doing this right now across Illinois using traditional erosion pins, laser scanning, LIDAR and remote sensing using modeling to upscale. But this is a project funded by Illinois NREC that is um, uh, in the high six figures, and it's a starting estimate. And it's gonna take four to five years of work across eight hot gates to get us a sense of this magnitude. So it's a lot of work to get decent numbers as a start point. So I think that's an explanation is that it's just very difficult. And this is going pretty well to give you a flavor as an update on that project. We've got erosion pins and remote sensing across uh, eight major hot gates that are diverse. So we capture the diversity of watersheds in the state with these eight hot gates. Um, we've got um, over 306 reaches, so stream reaches that we are looking at with thousands of erosion pins currently. And we're also looking at going back to the 1930s historical remote sensing, so basically photos from planes to look at the meandering of the stream as we can see here. The second question that you might be asking is, okay, um, you're saying that stream bank erosion, Andrew, is not from agriculture. And I, I wanna be very clear here, it's not a fertilizer contribution. And people might claim, and I think that they're right, that, well, aren't there indirect effects of agriculture 
via land use. The fact that we're draining fields, that we've got tiles and ditches, we've increased or we've at least impacted the hydrology of the watershed from how we do add. Fair enough. And that's a good point. And the question might be asked, is that indirectly exacerbating stream power and more powerful streams, more flashy streams after precip, um, it might be leading to more bank erosion. So the evidence suggests that in some cases that's true, but in some cases it's the opposite. In the case of tiling, we might be decreasing stream flashiness and thus bank erosion. So here's a recent study from this fall. They look at the flashiness of streams, which is assessed by the RBI, the RB index. As that number goes up, streams are just more flashy. And what we have here are soils that are low infiltration on the left and soils and rather watersheds with soils that have high infiltration rates. So typically more sand or less clay. <laughs> okay, so what we find is that as we increase the amount of tiling in the watershed, at which they had as low, medium, and high percent of the watershed that's tiled, and watersheds that have low infiltration soils, so let's say more clay, less sand, tiling decreases stream flashiness. And we get the opposite trend. We get more flashiness with more tiling in watersheds with soils that already drain decently well. So this explains why we do find conflicting findings in different studies. It, it does depend in part, as we've seen here, on the infiltration of soils. And the mechanism is that if soils don't infiltrate well, the left-hand figure, there's going to be a lot of runoff on the surface, and that will drive flashiness. So by tiling, we mitigate the flashiness from surface runoff, and we smooth out the system. There's less flashes. But if soils are already infiltrating decently well, then increasing how well they infiltrate with more tiling backfires in the sense of more flashiness. In reality, there's many other factors like slope, how wet the soil was, antecedents is what we call it, uh, the depth of the water table as well. And so this requires meta-analysis and modeling and very good field studies to get a handle on where does tiling as it's currently practiced decrease or increase flashiness? And where it increases it, can we think about uh, tile drainage management as a means to help tiling not contribute and even help smooth out flashiness? I think there's room for tiling to help reduce bank erosion through that effect. So currently we're doing another meta-analysis is the number four that we're doing with USB support. This is with NCGA support as well. And what we're finding is that a lot of studies to date are in regions where historically folks have tiled. So the Baltic Sea Basin, uh, Sweden, Germany, and then the Midwest, as we can see here. And this is, I think, interesting because a lot of our tiles were initially made and designed by immigrants from Sweden and North Germany who were indentured servants or even um, recruited by land owners in Illinois. So that, for example, in Chatsworth, which is a town north of Champaign about an hour or so, that was a Swedish colony and it was a tile production center for central Illinois in the 1800s because the Swedes and the Germans knew how to tile their clay soils in that part of the world. So it's partly why we have a large population of Swedes and Germans in, in, some, uh, in, in some parts of the state. They were brought over specifically for this knowledge. And I think it's interesting that we still see that signature of the development of tile drainage, uh, which was clay tiles originally in that part of Europe, as well as in the Midwest. So that will give us an answer to the question of, well, when and where does tile drainage and thus ag land use indirectly contribute to stream bank erosion through the effects on flashiness and also identify how can we solve that. Okay, so I wanna now switch gears from the legacy phosphorus that we've been talking about that's been focused on the sediments that are uh, loaded by bank erosion. Again, that study from Ohio suggests that most of the sediments and streams are from banks, depending on where you are in the watershed, but on average, that seems to be the case. So let's talk about the right-hand side of this, the residual phosphorus, meaning what some folks call legacy soil phosphorus, but really what we should be calling more technically the buildup of phosphorus from past applications. So the way that we can come up with the amount of, of the residual phosphorus is by a mass balance. We know the inputs, we know the outputs. You subtract output from input. If that number is positive, it means that you had more going in than more going out. So you've built up. It's like a check book or your bank account. You want a positive balance. You want to be building things. 
A negative balance means that you're mining the soil. You're losing money in the accounts. More is going out than what's coming in. And we can do this at state scale to field scale. I'll begin with the state scale example. This is a, a publication by Mark David from 2000 that we've modeled or continued with uh, Dr. McIsaac through today. And what we found from this is that, well, really two things. First is that there was a period where there was a lot of residual phosphorus built up in soils from past applications. Uh, specifically, we're talking on the order of 5 billion pounds of phosphorus that were built up, 4.9 billion pounds more precisely. It's about 200 pounds of P per acre. That's roughly 500 pounds of P2O5, which is roughly 1,000 pounds of DAP per acre, just ballpark. That's a lot of phosphorus that built up, but it's only a 5% enrichment of what's already native phosphorus because we have 95 billion pounds of phosphorus naturally in our soils with no fertilization. So that's the first input. It's a large magnitude from a water quality perspective, and it might be contributing to current losses from this chronic leak of past residual peak. Second insight is that we've been mining phosphorus or we're in a phosphorus negative balance since the 1990s, which we've confirmed to be true through present day. Now, the question is, well, that's a calculation. And it's also, it's useful, but it's not super useful at the watershed scale, like the Huck 8, because this is a statewide number. We don't have it broken down by the Huck 8 scale, which would be useful because then we could explain or try to explain why do we see these apparent jumps from year to year in some Huck 8s with, with data showing that there's under application of P. So what we need to do is to validate these balances. And that's what we're doing with NREC support as well with IFB using an archive on campus. So let me explain how this works. We have samples as far back as 1860s shown here through present day. And this archive of over 7,000 samples across the state shown here as red dots. These are to full depth. So we can go three to five foot depth. We know where they were taken. We know when they were taken which means that by resampling these locations, we can try to validate the balance that we see here. Can we identify where this residual phosphorus is at the watershed scale? So we've already quantified the amount of phosphorus before the use of fertilizers in the state using the archive samples pre-1950. And that's what it looks like here. Now, again, we've only enriched this by 5%. So the map of peace stocks today should look a lot like this map. This is an example of the kind of insights that we can do with basic research. This is total phosphorus, not Bray, not Melic, but total phosphorus to depth. Look at those numbers. They're kilo per hectare, which is going to be a little bit higher than pound per acre. But we're talking up to 20,000 pounds of P naturally in our soils per acre to three to five foot depth. Why does this matter? Well, by resampling these locations, we can understand where this increase in residual P is located. That's useful because it helps us link watershed scale P fluxes with measured residual phosphorus. So we're making good progress towards this. We've sampled 8% of sites, 453 sites across the state, which you can find through the QR code. Uh, shameless plug, if you can help us identify the sites, who owns it, and help us get permission to resample. This is an example of what we can provide for the state, high quality evidence-based assessments of our P losses within the non-point source sector. Let's look at a field scale. So I just showed you a mass balance to figure out residual phosphorus at the state scale. What about field scale? Let's look at the Morrow plots on campus. This is the uh, oldest experiment in the Western hemisphere, second oldest in the world, established in 1876. And we've got records on yields and inputs. So we can come up with balances shown here that we've calculated. We've also confirmed them by actually sampling and quantifying changes in P stocks. So these plots were established 148 years ago. They're still going. And our lab, as the stewards of the plots, have been trying to use them more and more to look at phosphorus. And what we see here is two examples of balances that we calculate for a fertilized treatment versus unfertilized. So these are both corn on corn since 1876. The data began on yields in uh, 1888. That's why we see it begin there. So what we see is that when you don't fertilize and you uh, grow corn each year, you know, even though it's 30 bushel corn per acre, we see that there's mining of phosphorus. So we've got a negative balance on the y-axis. Note that in the fertilized system that got phosphate rock, 
In about less than 20 years, we had a massive increase in 15 years of the positive balance. So what we did in the 1910s has led to a phosphorus balance that we still see today. We've built up the residual P and it's still in the system. Note that when we began to use soil test-based recommendations by the 2000s, before that it was a flat rate of DAP every year, we then began to see drawdown. So a nice example of how the four R's can be useful for decreasing the residual phosphorus that we've built up. I think that's a win-win. It saves on inputs for farmers, because they can mine the buildup safely, and then it reduces a potential leakage source of non-point P. The point that I want to make is that we know that over 100 years ago, phosphate rock being applied to the marl plots is still responsible for the buildup of P today. This matters because it means that a lot of our P losses today, even the ones that are coming from ag fields, may not be from fertilizer being put on today or what would be put on tomorrow. It's the residual P. So here's an example from Douglas County, south of Champaign, uh, courtesy of Lowell's group published in 2020. What we see is that uh, at this site, there were old, uh, or there were formerly hog production sites, swine barns, as shown from the left-hand figure. Now on the right hand, we can see that this is that the gray phosphorus levels are very high. So they're way over the 15 to 20 ppm threshold above which we don't need to apply more P. We're getting up to 157 ppm. And these Bray P hotspots, top six inches, are overlying tiles that have been put in today. What we see is that from 24 to 46% of the DRP loads through tiles can be explained by the Bray phosphorus, suggesting that up to 40% of our DRP losses today in 2020 through tiles are coming from manure from hogs pre-1950 at this field site. That's an example of why we care about the residual phosphorus. It has a legacy of P losses today. So I will wrap up with a case study from the Baltic Sea Basin. Again, this is where tile drainage was born. We imported Swedish and German and Polish immigrants to Illinois to drain our sites with their technologies, clay tiles back then. So the largest hypoxic zone in the world is the Baltic Sea Basin, not the Gulf. Gulf is close behind. And this hypoxic zone has been growing for the last 100 years in the Baltic Sea Basin. Now, there was a recent study done by Swedish researchers trying to understand, well, source apportionment. Where is the P coming from? And I'll walk you through the figure here on the bottom left. So a few things to note. First on the x-axis is the decade. So we're going over time. And then on the y-axis is simply the amount of P loads. And there's four sources that they apportion. First in green is what they call background, and this includes stream bank erosion. Like any true background, it stays constant over time. We will not be able to manage that appreciably. The next source is mobile legacy. So that would be DRP that's chronically released from, as we just saw, residual P in fields and legacy sediments already in channels largely from bank erosion. And note that this legacy mobile P really jumped from 1960 to 1980, and then it began to decrease, thought to be from the residual manure or fertilizer that was built up 1960 to 1980. So that's an example of residual fertilizer. The orange is effectively point sources, direct coastal effluent. That means we're discharging raw sewage, industrial waste into the Baltic Sea directly from the coastal facilities. So with permits that were put on point sources in the 1980s, we saw a more than 5x reduction in this point source contribution. That's a success story. Also a success story is what we would think of as agricultural contributions. So rapid transport of DRP from fertilizer or from manure, we saw a 4x reduction in the same time period. So this is a nice example of how BMPs for point and non-point source help decrease this 60% of total P loads to being, uh, roughly speaking, 20% of what they were in combination beforehand. That's a great success story. Note that in that same time period, the mobile legacy P slowly decreased. That's the drawdown. And that the background, of course, has not been changing. So then the author said, okay, what if we think of the options on how do we decrease future load reductions. We can't manage the background. The mobile legacy just decreases by itself. Can we make farmers more efficient with their P inputs to help decrease the rapid transport? 
And what they modeled was three cases of PU sufficiency. So one is business as usual, second is 80% PUE, and third is 90% PUE. Remember that we're already at 80% PUE in the in the state and in the northern part of the Corn Belt. So again, what we're already at is the aspirational target of other parts of the world for how efficient we are with our inputs of phosphorus. And as you might expect, increasing PUE to 80% or even 90% didn't really do a whole lot because the majority of our P now in the 2000s in the Baltic Sea are background like stream banks, which we can't manage. And then we've got this slow drawdown of mobile legacy. Now we can increase our reductions in this fraction of the legacy by drawdown. So if you under apply P relative to, to crop P removal rates, because you know you've got a high Bray or, or Malik P test, that's what they're doing here in this scenario. They're counting as part of increased PUE, counting the historical applications. And then the contemporary applications, increasing the efficient use of them slightly decreases the shade in blue. The point is that the decreases overall um, in the future are not going to be coming from increasing P fertilizer use efficiency, which is why regulations on P applications won't really do much in situations when most of our P is legacy, meaning sediments or residual from soils and from stream bank erosion. This is a nice example of how source apportionment is essential to inform effective policy and practices. To summarize all this, non-point P losses overall are really hard to quantify by definition, and the loads are agronomically minor but still appreciable for water quality. That's why we're very efficient with our P fertilizer in Illinois, and yet we're the biggest loser of phosphates to the Gulf of Mexico. Overall, non-point P losses are driven by erosion, stream banks, and in field. So I think these were more of a conservation challenge. We know that it's not an over-application of fertilizer issue in Illinois for the past 30 years. 30 years because we did apply more than what crops needed pre-1990. That's the residual P. Importantly, we do not in non-point P loss estimates and policy account for bank erosion in any Mississippi River Basin state, including ours. That's the problem. Legacy P in soils, what we should be calling the, the residual P as well as in the stream channels, as sediments, these have different origins, but the important point is that because we don't account for them, we are in for a rough surprise of lag times that might mean we're waiting decades or more to see decreases in P loads, even with BMPs going on to acres. So we have to quantify these lag times of legacy phosphorus. There's four reasons why. One is we want to basically, well, account for direct ag contributions. So not even how much is coming from non-ag, non-point like stream banks, but how long it's going to take to decrease that if we uh, shut off all the ag contributions tomorrow. Second, this is a chance to use our resources more efficiently to manage a non-point source of P. There are options, things like where might there be watershed management plans that decrease stream power to therefore mitigate bank erosion? It's still going to happen, but we might think about holistic approaches to watersheds to decrease stream bank erosion. Fourth, and I think this is really important, is that we need to communicate to policy and the public that our NLRS expectations and timelines may not be quite correct. The Illinois NLRS is incorrect and equating non-point source with agriculture. But it also needs, I think, to have a better handle or estimate on how long it will take for these legacy sources to decrease, even as BMPs go on to acres. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Andrew, thanks so much for that. And um, I think it was great. And we do have a couple questions already loaded. So I'm just gonna go um, kind of in the order they came in. Uh, Jeff O'Connor asked, I am a drainage district commissioner in Northeast Illinois. When stream bed sediment is periodically removed, clean and clean the channel, we might, what might P readings do during cleaning and how long might P readings remain abnormal? So can you maybe comment on that a little bit? That's a great question. Thanks, Jeff, for, well, for the question. So um, I think during cleaning when there's, well, it's pretty well established, I think, that when we're disturbing sediments, there's a lot of 
uh, phosphate that is going to pulse and go downstream. <clears throat> I know that dredging is an issue for aquatic ecosystems. It does make sense in some context to dredge. Um, an example here is in, in Dane County in Wisconsin, where Madison is in Lake Mendota, uh, the county figured out that the most effective use of dollars to decrease P loads to Lake Mendota is just to dredge a lot of the small streams that feed into the lake. And so dollar per P pound removed from the system, it made sense to dredge these sediments. Yes, there's a short-term increase in P load because of the shaking up of these sediments, but in the end, it's out of the system. How long that would take, I'm not sure, Jeff. That's a good question. But I think uh, within, I'm going to guesstimate five to 10 years, the net effects seem to be worth it. In the case of Dane County, Wisconsin, they dated the sediments and found that most were from the 1880s. So they were from a while ago, from likely moldboard plowing of prairies in that county, leading to massive overland flow of bank or of, uh, of soils over the banks into the channels. Thanks. So uh, one next question, um, and this is kind of pointed at at you as a university professor, Andrew. I like this question. Were fertilizer recommendations by the universities too high in the past? And that then that caused buildup of nutrients in our soils. So is it the university's fault? I think that's what the question is really asking. It's a fair question. Maybe. Um, and I'm saying maybe not as a cop out, but I don't know yet. Um, there's evidence that, yes, I think there were some recommendations that led to over application of phosphorus beyond crop P needs. So here's an example. We know that there were recommendations in the 1900s, like 1908, to be putting on up to a thousand pounds of P as, sorry, a thousand pounds of phosphate rock. And a big unknown here is, well, what's the P205 of phosphate rock? If we assume it was the Tennessee Brown mines that was the main source of Illinois for, uh, for the state, excuse me, pre-1940, it's about 12% P205. So a thousand pounds of 12% P205, that's 120 pounds of P205 per acre. And that was every three to six years was the recommendation. So a lot of the recommendations by the land grant, so we're talking here like pre-World War II, were pretty high doses of phosphate rock to recapitalize your soils. There was even a book called Thread from Stones. And in the book Thread from Stones, published by the U of I soil scientist, Dr. Hopkins, the idea was that limestone and phosphate rock, uh, adding high amounts gives you slow release sources of P and corrects for pH. So 120 uh, pounds of P205 per acre seems like not a whole lot, but when, when yields were 30 bushels of corn per acre, the removal rates were also pretty low of P. But then again, that was every three to six years. So there's some math that we have to do here. There's evidence still like in the Morrow plots, as you all saw, that following the land grant wrecks, we way over applied phosphate rock at the Morrow plots and encumbered a massive positive balance within just 15 years. So I think a mix of not knowing any better and the misconception that phosphorus doesn't leach as much is saying that phosphate doesn't leach at all um, was incorrect. So I think we've always thought as phosphate not being lost, it can still be lost. This is not as mobile as nitrogen. That's a long answer, Ron, but I think there is evidence that, yeah, there were some, what we now know to be faulty recommendations by the land grants. So thanks for that response, Andrew. I think that was good. So I do want to remind people you can put questions in the Q&A and Andrew will pop up um, and answer them. I did have one question, Andrew, and this kind of stemmed from the Chicago Trib uh, Tribune article that you shared at the beginning. Um, one question I get from farmers a lot is, um, or maybe not a lot, but occasionally is, why should we really, as farmers, as Illinois farmers, why does impacts in the Gulf of Mexico matter to us? Is that really what should be motivating us um, activity-wise and things like that? Can you maybe comment a little bit on that on a kind of a bigger scale or high level? Yes, I think there's three reasons. Um, one is very utilitarian and practical, and that's there's now some precedent for lawsuits to be brought towards watersheds uh, that are upstream. And so that might be local at state scale, and you might think it could be regional. So the Gulf of Mexico fisheries, for example, um, 
might have a case to bring against the watersheds that drain all the phosphate and nitrate into their watershed where they fish. So you could argue that we should care from a cell preservation perspective. Um, I'm not sure that that's the best way to do it. I think the second case would be is that it's the right thing to do, that if we can do better, then we should do better. Um, I'm not a farmer, so it's not my place to tell people to do that. But I've heard some people say that. And I, I admire that philosophy is if we can decrease our P losses, um, we should think about doing that because, well, it is good for the basin overall. Uh, I know that that's still an appeal to good nature. But then the third reason why I think matters is that uh, I think we've overemphasized distant water quality, the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that we should focus on local water quality. There's still impacts on local watersheds. So in the case of Ohio, Lake Erie is a real problem. People can't have fun in the lake and they have issue with drinking water from the lake. So there's still impacts on local water quality. And I suspect, I think there's been a big public, um, that there's been a big publicity issue by pitching this challenge as always the Gulf of Mexico because there's local impacts on our water resources right here at the county level because of these losses that we, I think, should care about because these are our communities. You could also argue a fourth reason, I just thought of one, is that to the extent that we're losing these nutrients, that's a waste of fertilizer. And I know it's not agronomically appreciable for phosphorus, it can be for nitrogen, but every little bit counts. And especially if we're eroding soil for our phosphorus losses, from fields, that's a huge threat to soil fertility and soil health. So I think there's a, a separate issue of this is a conservation challenge. And to keep land uh, in its prime state for Illinois, we should think about preserving topsoil. So four reasons why I think that we should care regardless of the Gulf of Mexico's water quality impacts, which I argue is still important. So we did get one more question. I think we're going to answer this one live and then probably wrap up the talk to be respectful of everyone's time, but recognizing the natural changing stream cycles, meandering, et cetera, what are your thoughts on the best management practice to reduce stream break erosion that will have longevity? It's a great question, Ryan. Um, let's see. This is a tough one. So to some degree, a lot of our bank erosion is natural because streams will meander. They're supposed to dissect the landscape as the phrasing goes. And in flatter landscapes like Illinois, especially central North state, they're, they're just going to meander. You can't stop that. And anybody who has property that's being sloughed off by a stream knows it's a little bit frustrating. We can try to stop stream bank erosion at small spatial scales with armoring. We put riprap on stream banks, incredibly expensive. Um, and it's not so it's it's not scalable. And also it's got not great impacts on aquatic systems from an ecosystem perspective. Uh, it's also not exactly pretty to look at versus a forested stream bank. So there are some places where that's merited. Like if you have a property like a house or a structure that's being threatened, by all means, riprap has its place. I think your point, Ryan, is on is is on point on it's a naturally changing cycle. Where I think we have room is thinking about can we manage the flashiness of streams, trying to smooth out the sudden flash of, of water after the precip event. And in some cases, tiles help us smooth out the flashiness. They're a solution. In some cases, they're contributing to the flashiness. So in the latter cases, can we have things like constructed wetlands to buffer the effluent from tiles to try to smooth out that flashiness. I think we're gonna have to consider watershed level plans at the Huck 8 scale even, thinking about how do we find the flash points and how do we intervene with a system like a wetland to help uh, smooth that out? It's not a great answer. And we a good question I think here, Ryan, would be how much of our stream bank erosion has been exacerbated by tiling Okay, can we then address that? But from what I've been reading, it seems like the majority of our bank erosion is unaffected by ag land use. Awesome. So thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us this morning. I do want to be respectful of your time. I know it's sure. it's still eight o'clock and you have the rest of your day. So with that, I think we're going to wrap up the meeting. Um, and again, thank you very much. This will be posted online um, sometime in the near future. So. Thanks, Corey. Thanks for having me and thank you all for your time.
Take care.